Living Adventurously is brought to you in partnership with Kamut, the route planning and navigation app that helps you make the most of your outdoor adventures. Whether you're cycling, hiking, running or bikepacking, Kamut's easy to use technology will get you out the door and exploring more of the great outdoors. You can see where I've been exploring by checking out the highlights of my journey on Kamut. Just follow the link in the show notes. My name is Alistair Humphreys. I set out on a bicycle journey around Yorkshire to speak to interesting, ordinary people who, in very different ways, are making an effort to live adventurously. I wanted to talk about what they do, about the barriers they've faced along the way, and to seek their perspective on some of the big questions that all of us encounter in our lives. Welcome to Living Adventurously. <laughs> I've written here, needs intro music. Um, okay, here we go. Um... <laughs> Have a loop. Sometimes you meet someone and you instantly think, this is a very lovely person. Occasionally, you encounter people who listen so incredibly deeply that they seem to know you and understand you straight away. Sophie Stevenson was both of those things. And she also drank fruit tea that perfectly matched her bright red shoes, which I thought was pretty cool. Sophie runs a company called The Thinking Project, which runs on the premise that the quality of everything that we do depends on the quality of the thinking that we do first. I asked Sophie about how to think, how to listen, and how to ask better questions. I'm not sure I achieved this myself, but despite my questions, Sophie certainly gave me fantastic answers and plenty to think about. Right. Right. Should we go for it? Yes. Hello, Sophie. Hello, Alistair. <laughs> um, I was interested when I found out about you and the idea of the thinking project, because one of the reasons I've got on my bike for a month is to try and give myself some time to think. So tell me, please, about reclaiming time to think. Uh, so one, I think, I mean, just even saying that, like the fact we have to reclaim time to think in itself is so telling. Um, but we do, I think, if we want to get good quality outcomes. So if we want to make sure we're doing the right things, enjoying our life, having really good um, yeah, experiences and doing stuff that's meaningful to us, I think the first step is whatever it looks like. So for you, a month away is reclaiming a big chunk. Um, but a lot of what I teach people is it's like it doesn't have to be those big chunks, but it has to be consistent enough. Um, but in my experience, it's, it's not enough just to... Like, you don't want to then just fill that with nothing. It's like, what are you going to do with that time to think differently? OK, so uh, what stops people thinking then? Because I remember my, mm. um, my brother, when he was little, uh, it's, it's one of our family stories, when my brother was little, he said to our dad, he said, Dad, do you ever talk to yourself inside your head? And my dad had to say, yes. That's called cool, thinking. So don't we just all think all the time? Yeah, we do. So, but unfortunately, most of what we do is um, what's called ruminative thinking. So we just um, think over the same thoughts repeatedly, coming up against the same old untrue and limiting assumptions. So we don't actually move forward in our thinking. Um, That's a great phrase. I've never heard of that. Ruminative thinking. Yeah. yeah and most of it is um, negative. Most of it is either backward looking or projecting into the future, which we're really bad at doing. So our brains are really bad at projecting into something we don't know. Bad as in... Inaccurate. Hard. It's really hard for us to project forward into a future we haven't seen. So what our brains will do is just try and keep us safe. So even if safe isn't good, we'll just stay doing what we're doing because how do we know? Like there's the potential it could go wrong, there's the potential it could be worse, there's the potential you get hurt, you could... Lots of yeah. assumptions that your brain will just grip onto and then stop. So most people, they're, they're exhausted from thinking, but it's because the quality of the thinking it's just the same. It's the same. We think the same and the same, and we don't get past that. Um, and you talk, and you said then that one thing that's important to try and do is it's almost active thinking. So a concerted effort to think 
more thoroughly, more deeply, more, more focused? What, what is it that... So I, I suppose I, I teach people how to be with somebody else in a way that enables them to think for themselves because unfortunately we're, even when we're on our own, so say you're on your own and it's lovely, you will end up distracting yourself. So after about, depending on your nature, it might be 10 seconds or it might be you might get a, a lovely 10 minutes, um, you'll start distracting yourself. And what having somebody else there who's listening to you, giving you really good attention, treating you like an equal, encouraging you, kind of keeps you on track. Um, whereas normally we kind of have a thought and we think, again, we think thinking should be linear. So you start at A and you're going to get to B and it will be a lovely journey. Um, and actually, as with any journey, is you start at A and then it all goes to poo and it all goes wrong and you take the wrong turn and, and that's what we do in our brain. So we make all these different connections and we're thinking about stuff. And at that point when it gets hard, so, oh, I want to do something different, we'll distract ourselves. So it's at that point I think you can almost pause and say, right, what is it I want? Like, what is it I'm trying to get to? Um, and again, what most people end up with is what they don't want. So you come up with this long list of, I don't want this and I don't want that. Um, but I think the first thing is to start really thinking about, like, what do you want? Like, what do you want? Um, and just allowing that to be, and not having to justify it, not having to defend it, not having to explain it to anyone else. Just allow yourself to feel into that. Um, and, and is it, what do you want, leaving aside the hypothetical barriers and obstacles and realities? Is it, because uh, I think it, sometimes I'm trying to think what I want, and I think, oh, and before I've even got anywhere down the line, I dismiss it because I think, oh, I, I can't afford that, I haven't got the time, or I'm not an expert at that. Is, that. is that a part of it, trying to park the problems whilst you first of all establish what, you, what, what you're after and why you want that? So I'd say let yourself want what you want first, and then, so a lot of the, what I teach you is about, so they're, they're called assumptions. So we jump to these assumptions that will stop us, you know, feeling how we want to feel or doing what we want to do. Um, and it can often be really useful just to interrogate those. Because again, when they're in... So an assumption is something we take as true and real, largely without evidence and largely unexamined. So it sits in our subconscious. And you can almost then just make a list of like, well, what, what am I assuming that's stopping me from doing this big dream? And you can list them all. And some of them will be true, you know, and some of them... But it's the untrue ones that we're interested in. So it's... So a lot of those will just be logistics. So, yeah, it might take a lot of time and money and you might have to change things and you might... People might laugh at you. It might fail. It's like, yep, that's yep. true. And you still want to do it. And is it, in your experience, is it the same things that are stopping everybody? That's really interesting. Um... I just wrote a piece on this asking that very question because I think at root there are a couple that keep coming up and up again and they're around um, a sense of worthiness, a sense of belonging um, and a sense of being enough um, that at root seem to drive people and again they, they tap into um, our need for safety, our need for connection um, and our need for autonomy. Um, so I, th I think... Uh, my answer is, I think so, but I don't know. And what's interesting is the way they manifest is completely different for each of us anyway. So my um, need for safety and connection would be very different to how that would manifest in your life because of our lived experience. Um, so that's what's, that's what's so fascinating. Um, and this, so the worthiness, belonging and being enough, is it, does it differ between men and women? Interesting, I've never seen a gender split in any of the work I do. So I've used to work in very male-dominated societies. Most of the work I do now is with much more with women. Um, I've seen no difference at all. But I think that's so... The, like, m the best analogy I've come up with is, like, if you've got a seed and you throw it in the ground, it will try its best to grow. Like, it will do its best. But if you put it in the right soil and the right conditions and you give it exactly what it needs, it will thrive and flourish. And I think our ability to think is the same. So I can just say to somebody, oh, like, just go and have 10 minutes and do some thinking. And they'll do their best, you know, based on what they've done previously. But if you give them the right conditions and you pay them attention and you treat them like they're an equal and you don't... You encourage them rather than compete with them, they're much more likely to thrive. And so I think it's, it's that. It's like men and women, I don't think, are different in the conditions we need to thrive. How we demonstrate that might be how we choose to live that um, but I think the conditions are universally recognized and 
pretty simple. We just don't get them. Simple but not easy. <laughs> simple but not easy. So, so how do how would someone go about trying to think more thoroughly and effectively about their life without having a expert mm. listener like you to sound off against? Or, or does the, or is it some? Do you think? Do you believe that to think? deeply you need someone listening to you I think it makes it easier I don't think it's impossible um, so I think so at its most simple I think what you're doing so making time is the first step so without that um, really hard having a sense of ease so trying to think when you're stressed um, is impossible our brains don't work very well so getting it's not enough just to have time you've got to have that space where you can be at ease and then allow yourself exactly that so start allowing yourself to consciously choose what it is you want in your life and what you don't um and then i would just be asking myself you know so say and do one at a time so don't you might have a list of 100 but try it in with one um and then just sort of asking yourself like what am i assuming that would stop me from doing this and then asking yourself at that point do i think that's true so do I think these are true? And not, is it true? Because that's a really different question. It will ask you to start justifying all of those assumptions. But do you think that that assumption is true? That would be a pretty good place to start. So do you think that assumption is true or is it masking or manifesting some different thing? Yeah, something else. There's that um, is it a Japanese thing of, or something, <laughs> of asking why five times. Yeah. Do you know that? Yeah, yeah. Um, which I love that. Can you mm. explain that more? eloquently than I do yeah I mean I th and I think that's going beyond and I mean one of the one of the things I t teach is around like we don't do our like we, we need to warm up to thinking well so like we could just have a conversation and it all stays on the surface so it's like how are you Alison? I'm fine how are you doing yeah kids fine yeah great nice adventure yeah I'm doing this and it's all lovely but there's no depth to it and what time does and what listening and you can do that you can listen to yourself what what that does is allow you to get deeper into well yeah why like why do i want it why do i want this and it's like mm. and you know my question was like so what so so what okay so i, I want to do this so what oh because i want more freedom so what oh mm. and at some point you'll get that like oh interesting and that's what i'm really interested in is yeah. that those moments of like ah oh, um yeah clarity clarity yeah. um i'm one of the reasons I'm doing this podcast is that it's just a really selfish, selfish, indulgent way to get to meet cool and interesting people and force them to tell me stuff. <laughs> it's great, so I really like that. But what I'm noticing in my brief podcast career is that it's really hard to listen to people. Um, well, on a simple level, because I'm trying to fiddle with the controls and think about my next question, but I think the, the, the time that this would be useful for me is if I listen really deeply to what people are saying, think about it, and then ideally think of another question. So how do I become a better listener? And it's most simple, just stop talking <laughs> as much. Um, no, so I think people mistake listening as they think it's a trait. I think people think you're either a good listener or you're not. And it's not, it's a skill. So you can, you've got, if you want to be a better listener, you've got to choose to be a better listener. You said you used to be a bad Terrible. listener. Terrible, yeah. My mum's, oh, I shouldn't talk about my mum, but she, so my mum's one of four sisters and I honestly don't think I finished a sentence till I left home, you know, and that was seen as a good thing. Um, but I used to chronically interrupt and I think people interrupt for lots and lots of different reasons. One is to show empathy and excitement. They think they're going to forget what they say. Um, when we care deeply about things, we find it really hard to not interrupt. Um, but when somebody's trying to think well, the impact of interruption is they will stop. So it's getting, can you re kind of, are you more interested in what the other person's about to say than what you already think? And for me, I always think, I know what I think currently, um, what's much more fascinating to me is learning something new that I don't know that I can then integrate into my experience and start thinking afresh. So I think one is, can you get really interested in other people? And you don't even have to be interested in the content, but just fascinated that they're fascinated in something. Um, and then try as best you can to not interrupt. So allow someone that space. Um, and I think of it as like people don't think, they think in waves. 
So you have a wave of thinking and that wave will self-generate. So it will then get its own speed and it will generate another wave of thinking. And most people in that pause think, oh, that's my, that's my term to go. I need to say something. And my sort of advice and experience is like, there is power in that pause. Like just let it ride itself out and people will just go again and again and again. And if they want something from you, they'll ask. We're really good at asking for input. So if I'm like, I'm finished, or I need something, I'll ask you. So just getting more and more comfortable with um, silence and that that is the place where new ideas are being generated. They're not a place that need filling or need to be rescued. It's like there's magic, magic in those pauses. I feel really bad right now speaking. <laughs> okay, then, so then once, once the silence ends and it is your time to speak, mm. How do you ask better questions? So again, I would say, what's the purpose of the question? So if, for me, the best pers purpose of a question is because it's going to help someone think for themselves. So I'd be trying to get them to generate their own questions. So I'd ask them, you know, what outcome do you want? What are you looking for? What would be interesting? And then I'd get them, I'd help them frame up a question. Um, I think the challenge with trying to... I, I mean, the, the, the best questions are questions you don't know the answers to. Like, you don't want to ask a question you already know the answer to. You, you know, that, so that for me is the first thing. It's like you want to have a curiosity. Some curiosity. Yeah, and, um, and not humbleness. That's the one. It's just um, like a sense of possibility around the question. But I think a question that's got an outcome you're driving to is a rubbish question. Like, just... Right. Yeah. Yeah, leading someone towards... Yeah. The place you think they should go. Yeah. Um, and for me, my, the questions I ask are, tend to be, um, they're either very broad or very specific. So the question I ask anyone, so whether it's coaching in a court, is like, what do you want to think about? And what are your thoughts? Because it's the biggest, broadest question we can come up with. Um, and then they will allow a process of working out what they want and it will narrow down. And then I might ask a more specific question around, so what would you most like to achieve or what would you most like to accomplish um yeah and what do you want to think about now <laughs> and what are your thoughts um well i've actually found this fascinating in terms of like i think there is a real parallel around why do people go on adventures like what is it you know there's something around um i think connecting more deeply with themselves or with places there's um there's something exciting and um it's the new you know people are and for me, what I found about thinking for myself is it's all those things. It's like I live a really, um, you know, not adventurous in a, I don't go traveling off in that kind of, that definition of adventurous, but I live a life that's really true to me. Um, and it takes courage. And I think good travels take courage, you know, and courage in its truest sense, which is um, like the, the root is core, which is heart. So it's staying true to what your heart says. And I think like good travel gets you closer to what your heart is telling you is important in your life. And I think that's what good thinking does. Exactly the same thing is what, what is true to us and how do we live that in a way that's meaningful? Yeah, I I'm very much agree that you are pursuing an adventurous life. That's why when I mm. came across you, I was intrigued. Um, but in a former life, you lived a more uh, <laughs> traditionally adventurous life. Uh, mm. You were in the Royal Navy oh, well, for Oh, you years. have done your research, yes. Um, what was... What, what was um, did you join the Navy for adventure? And what did adventure mean in those days? I think I joined the navy because I, I chose what I thought would be hardest and least likely to, you know I was like if I can succeed in that environment I can probably so I think my decision making in my 20s was much more around challenge and um, proving proving to other people what a good life looked like um, but I also was intrigued you know I definitely was um, um, they offer amazing training and there's lots of really good stuff about the navy but I don't think, in some ways, it's it's very, um, what's the word, curated adventure. So it's, it's, it's safe, so you see a lot and do a lot. Um, but it was, an, I mean, for a 21-year, I was commissioned at 21, um, I had amazing, you know, like leadership, introduction to leadership and um, working with people and, and sort of doing that. But I don't think I necessarily was looking for adventure. I think I was looking... For myself, I think I was just growing up. 
And um, what did you prove to yourself in the, in the military? I proved to myself that there are certain boundaries that I'm never, that I would not compromise on being myself. So for me to stay in the military, and I, I have really good, I've got a lot of friends in the military, I've got a huge respect for it. But for me personally to stay in the military, I wouldn't have been able to be me. And that became really clear at that moment. What I proved was that was more important than anything else, really. So whatever I had to do to get out, I would leave. Okay, um, so yeah, so you had, that was quite a distinct phase of your life yes. then. Then you went off to live in Australia and you're living the corporate life and yeah. drinking wine <laughs> in the sunshine and having a lovely time and mm. living the dream. Um, why then, what made you change from that to stop that, come back here, change your job? Because in some ways you were, well, I'm putting words in your mouth here, the idea of living the dream, is that mm. vaguely fair or not? And if so, mm. what then made you want to change from... Because what I'm interested in is how... What is it that people want to do in their life and what stops them taking the steps towards that? So what I'm interested mm. in in this question is you had that life in Australia, which sounds lovely. What then prompted you to decide to change, to come back to here? Um, so that life I was living was around what I thought I should do and what I thought success was. And I got there and it was a really distinct evening. As I can remember sitting there in this beautiful house surrounded by everything I said I'd wanted. And it was almost like this, oh shit, like this isn't it at all, like this isn't enough. Um, it's not my life, you know, <laughs> it was like, ah, okay. Um, but I'd found Nancy Klein's time to think. So I'd been doing a lot of thinking for myself over a two year period around well, what do I want and what's scaring me. Um, and I think I was scared. Like I think up to that point, I had been living my life based more on what I was scared of. So not having enough money, not being successful, not do, you know, it was all the knots um, that were driving my behavior. And I got to the point I was like, enough. Like, when's enough? when is enough? Like, when will I have enough money? When will I have enough security? When will I have enough of these things to stop that being a driver? Um, and I decided that was enough. So I had enough and I would stop and I would start making my decisions and applying everything to, like, what do I love? Like, what do I want? So my motivations completely shifted from being fear-based to being much more driven by love. And not love in a kind of, it's like, what do, what do I feel passionate about? What drives me? What energizes me? Um, what do I want my life to look like without reference to anyone else? Um, yeah. And what was, what was the um, first step you took towards actually turning that into action? Because it's, it's all very well mm. being in your nice house in Australia thinking, this isn't what I want. And then what step do you take to concrete steps towards making a change? So the first step for me was um, a decision. So I decided I would leave Australia and come back to the UK. So that was a, I was, it wasn't an a when, no, it wasn't an if, it was when. So I, I knew I was going to do that, which therefore meant I was going to, leave my corporate job, which was well paid. Um, and I think this journey is, will be different for everybody. So for me, I wasn't prepared to just leap. So I wanted to make sure I had a bridge between that life and um, sort of leaving. So I um, m did a two years master's <laughs> as kind of a like get out of corporate, but don't just leap into the unknown. So I did, I trained as a teacher um, in at Melbourne University and that kind of just gave me a bit of breathing space around one world and another. Um, and then I knew once I finished that course, I would um, come back to the UK and, and start again. Ironically, I don't, I, I teach now, but I don't do sort of educational classroom based teaching at all. Um, but again, I think that was just a, a meander towards where I wanted to be. Um, and I think like some people say leap, you know, some people can do that. Um, I'm quite sort of, I wasn't prepared to do that. You know, I wanted some, a little bit of security um, around that leap. But I think that will be, that's different for yeah. everyone. I, but yeah, my mm. thinking on that is it's always much easier to leap when you have a safety net. Yeah. So um, I think often the people who are advising just leap mm. actually have the safety net. Um, yeah. And certainly in my life, I'm very glad that I also like trained to be a teacher mm. and that's for although I'm not a teacher, it's always ever since felt like a safety net that if, mm. if all this writing, whatever goes wrong, I can go get a teaching job. And if that fails, I can go get 
job in McDonald's or something. So having this safety net of knowing I can do things if it all goes wrong is very reassuring mm. to actually making stuff happen. And if I can just tell that, is, and I think that's the thing, is like people think, it's like life happens in these small steps. So like you start and you make a decision and you make a decision and sometimes these small steps lead you like way off course and then it feels like this enormous leap to get back. And it's like, oh, but actually you can also just take small steps back as well and then all of a sudden, you, you know, but I think we're, we're so um, seduced by the idea of like, you can just switch, you can just, I don't like what I'm doing, change. And that's just not been my experience at all. Like, I think things need nurturing and we need to be gentle and kind and have some ease around it. And it might take some time, but you've got to, you know, if you just start, that's okay. And knowing it might take some time. But I think, yeah, what people just want it to be now. And it's like, actually that just, again, has not been my experience. It's like, but what's possible in small steps is transformative and life-changing and amazing and exciting. You just got to take these small steps. Um, yeah, it's it's, re um, it's really interesting how much of what you're saying has complete parallels with mm. my more normal adventuring experience. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts on um, vulnerability mm. and uh, is being vulnerable not just a sign of weakness? No, and I don't think I, I would stand on the gi the shoulders of... There's so much research now around... Um, we don't like feeling vulnerable. So, and I think it's OK, you know, I think that's OK just to acknowledge that. Like, we don't like feeling vulnerable. It draws on really strong triggers around um, all of it. Like, our, our base instinct is to survive. So as soon as we start feeling vulnerable emotionally or physically, it's like, ugh. So it draws a stress response, um, which is completely natural. Um, but... For me, it's like the people I am the most vulnerable with are the people I have the strongest relationships with. The environments I've been in where I've been the most vulnerable, apart from like, unless I'm being just stupid, you know, but like where I've actually been vulnerable are the experiences that have completely transformed my life, you know, and it's like, so they, I just can't see a correlation. It's almost like a, we think it, but it, it just doesn't stack up. Um, it, it just doesn't stack up to experience. And, but I think if we want to, um, like, I'm trying to think now, like, what, what makes me feel vulnerable? Most of it's untrue. You know, like, it was that feeling, you know, it'd be an untrue and limiting assumption. You know, it's like that people might judge me or I might be, you know, might do something, it'd be so bad, I'd never have any money coming in ever again. It's like, really? You know, I think I've got a pretty good track record now of being able to get myself out of trouble. Um, but I just, I just don't think it stacks up. And I think if you could, anyone can ask themselves, the fre whether it's a friend or a relationship where you have been truly vulnerable, um, how has that relationship sustained over time? And, um, but is it, there's also, I think, a really interesting um, relationship between vulnerability and trust. So people think to be vulnerable, you have to trust somebody. And actually, it's the other way around. The people we trust are the people who are vulnerable with us and the people we can be vulnerable with. And that's those really strong, trusting relationships. But there's almost this, especially in organisations, it's like, well, we only, you, you can't, you know, you have to have trust to be, you know, and it's like, it's just not true. Um, yeah. I found um, vulnerability to be almost, well, one of the most thrilling parts of adventures, really, mm -hmm. is just choosing to do something that makes you feel vulnerable. And that mm -hmm. might be in a physical sense or emotional. Um, but I, I, one of my, the, my favourite adventures I've ever done was um, I spent a month busking through Spain with a violin, <laughs> despite basically not being able to play the violin and being really shy and the thought of having to play in music in public horrifying me. And the first day I stood up in this town square to play was the first time I ever busked and I just felt extraordinarily naked and vulnerable. It's horrific. But as the trip progressed, I just the vulnerability of being rubbish became such a strength. And it was a really wonderful thing to just feel, I'm really bad, this is tapping into so many things, make me very uncomfortable, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Mm. And that then becomes almost like a superpower. Um, mm. Yeah, it's, once you embrace it, it's a fantastically positive asset, isn't it? It is, and I, I mean, in some ways, I think that's why, um, it's really, like, thinking for yourself is actually quite a radical, challenging act because when you think for yourself 
invariably things start changing. You know, you start actually really taking responsibility and making choices, and that sometimes comes with a necessity to change and a vulnerability around this might not be working and, oh, I'm going to have to do something. But as you do that more and more, and it's like I was saying, I've, I have got complete, and not in any arrogant way, an unshakable confidence in my own ability now to think because I've done it so much and I've pushed through that like, oh, I don't think I can, oh, oh, I can do that. Oh, yeah, interesting. Um, and I've really examined those assumptions around what does it, what does that mean? Am I truly vulnerable or is it just a bit uncomfortable? Um, but it is, it's, it is a superpower. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's, yeah. Um, yeah. My final question for you is what do you do regularly that is simple but not easy? Good question, good question. What do I do that is simple but not easy? I meditate, simple but not easy. I drink a lot of water, simple but not easy. Um, I don't have any social media or gadgety things on my phone so I, I have none of that on my phone and when I'm with my children I don't have my phone at all so when I'm with when I'm with the kids I don't have my phone and I on a weekly basis think for myself so that's either in person so with one of my um, thinking partners or if I don't have someone else I'll do it on paper so I'll sit down, give myself half an hour um, and literally say, what do I want to think about? And I've got, I do like an on paper exercise. So I'll do, um, and it can just stop that ruminative thought. So, yeah. Brilliant. They are fantastic answers. Sophie, I've so enjoyed talking with you. It's been really, really fascinating. So thank you for your time. Thank you for helping me learn to be a better listener. And you are going to be such an international superstar when my podcast is listened to by more people than just your husband. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Do you I get much. to appreciate you? Do I get to appreciate you? Go on then. Um, so what I've most appreciated, Alistair, is there is you make such an easy connection with people that I could talk to you for hours, and but it feels really equal. So it feels like we, we're, we're just having a chat and it's a lovely dialogue that... I get to learn and we just get, yeah, so it's, it's the um, connection and ease with which you connect. So thank you. That's very kind. Thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Living Adventurously. There's show notes from every episode on my website, alistairhumphreys.com slash podcast. If you have enjoyed it, please take a screenshot of your phone and pop it up on social media or leave a review with your podcast provider. It makes a massive difference. Thank you very much. I teamed up with Kamut to make this podcast happen. In case you missed it, Kamut is an outdoor planning and navigation app that helps you explore more of the great outdoors. One of the many ways Kamut helps you have better adventures is with detailed route profiles. So, you've got your basic route in place with Kamut. Next step is to check the route profile. The profile displays the information you want to see, like the, the surface type, especially important if you're on a bike, and elevation profile, especially important for everyone, the ups and the downs. On a road bike, for example, that means you can anticipate the big climbs or ensure your adventure only includes tarmac, unless you want to spice it up and you want to suffer, in which case you can hunt for a gravel route or more single track. If you're hiking, you'll be able to see your elevation gain, as well as where on the route you'll need to push on to get through the uphills. Your very own outdoor experiences are waiting for you. Go explore more with Kamut. Head to commute.com slash G and use the voucher code adventurous to claim your free region bundle.